When we talk about juggling, there's this inherent assumption. We've always been juggling, and we always will be juggling. And so it's one long, unbroken line of juggling all the way along. But that's a lot to take in. We would somehow like to condense it, because when we talk about juggling, we often talk about these short patterns, these short repeating patterns. So we'd like to find a way to have a nice, simple way to think about and discuss what's going on. So our goal for today is to move from the line and get to the circle. Let's begin. So look at the following. Here's a juggling pattern. The site swap is two, three, one, two, seven. So it's period five and it repeats. Two, three, one, two, seven. Two, three, one, two, seven. Two, three, one, two, so forth and so on. Now, when you look at this pattern, you see it repeats every five beats. So what you could do is you could take just one block of length five and move it along. So for instance here, you'll see if it's perfectly right on top, then you can translate and again, if it's perfectly and again and again, so forth and so on. So really this one little pattern here completely captures the behavior. So now we say, okay, that's really the essence. What we can do is then take it and wrap it around. And if we did that, we'd end up with a cylinder. And it would look something a little bit like this. So we have this pattern, and lo and behold, as we spin it around, it traces out the whole behavior. And therefore, we can capture all the, the behavior in this circular repeating pattern. Okay, so what's going on? Well, we can imagine taking this and squishing it down flat. And so now we say, aha, here's a way we can think of it. So what do we have? Well, there's the circle here. And notice it has these five beats and it goes around and around and around. And so two, three, one, two, seven, back to two, three, one, two, seven, so forth and so on. And you can see, that we have these throws, a two, a three, a one, a two, and a seven. That wraps all the way. In fact, it goes more than one time around. And so now we can say, aha, this is probably the better way to think of these periodic patterns. So our goal is to say, okay, how do we get the math involved that allows us to do this? So consider, if you will, the number line. So here's our number line, and uh, we've marked some points. Of course, we can't draw everything. There's infinitely many points. That's kind of our problem, right? We, we don't want to have to deal with infinitely many things. So what can we do? Well, what we can do is we can take it and just sort of start to spiral it around so that we can have these points wrapped around. And uh, much like you might see on a, a spring or a slinky type thing. And now we can take that and push it down so that the points, they all lie on top of each other. And so we can say, aha, we really have this circle going on here, this circular behavior. And so what, what's happening here? Well, we've essentially taken that line and just looped it around the circle infinitely often. Now you might say, well, wait, we've lost something, right? We have infinitely many points up here. We only have five points down there. Where do the infinitely many points go? There's, there's a big gap, right? Well, the key here is this idea of wrapping around. So when I look at a point, say I look at this blue point right here, it corresponds to all of the blue points that we see along the way. So for instance, this would correspond to eight and to three, and to negative two and to negative seven, and many, many more besides. So it really is saying, hey, one point corresponds to lots of points. So it's like we've taken all of the numbers and we've split them up into five groups. So we have five groups, and each one of them corresponds to a group where all the numbers are offset by five, right? Okay, because eight, the three, that's five down, to minus two, five down again, to minus seven, five down again. 
You can do it with any color, say this white color. 6 down to 1, down to negative 4. So uh, what we have is we somehow have partitioned or split up the numbers in a very nice way. Now, on a side note, you can do this also with the real number line. And this is a, a fun little thing to talk about. So here, what we're doing is very discrete. For the continuous thing, what you can do is if you start with just the line, we call that R, what you can do is you can say map a point x goes to what we call e to the i times x. Now, what is that doing? Well, it turns out that this, in effect, takes you to a point on the unit circle in the complex plane. So that uh, what you end up having here is that you map onto a circle. So that this behavior of mapping onto circles can be done both continuously and discreetly. Our main thing right now is to say, okay, what's going on when we talk about this mapping? What's important for us to understand? So let's let n be our period. We talked about period five before, in that we had a pattern that repeated every five beats. But of course, it can be any number we want. It could be 12, could be 11, could be 1,017. Anything we want, anything we want. And now what we're going to say is, okay, when are two numbers in the same grouping? Well, they're in the same grouping if they differ by some jumps of size n, or rather multiples of n, right? So it could be like n or 5n or a million. They just have to differ by some multiple of n. We use the, the fun word equivalent. So not equal, but equivalent. All right, so we'll say that i is equivalent to j, and we add mod n. Now, mod here is short for modulo. If and only if, so this is not a typo. It's not if. It's a, a shorthand notation. If and only if, and now, what's this? This says n, and when you see this line here, that means divides, j minus i. So that says... Look, the difference between j and i is some multiple event. That's what this means. So two numbers are considered the same if they differ by some multiple event. So what we've done is, is we've done our grouping. You can go back to the previous page, right, where we talked about, oh, we have these numbers, and they're, there's, they all are offset by fives, or rather multiples of five, and we've grouped everything together. Of course, there's nothing special about five. Uh, one of the places where we're very used to modular arithmetic is with clocks and time. Because we think of 12 hours. But of course we could say, well, what happens if we go past 12 hours? So we know it's 10 a.m. And uh, we've just heard that there's the new Starbucks coffee flavor. Ah, oh, and we're going to meet our friends in three hours. Well, if it's 10 a.m., we're going to meet our friends in three hours. It's not 13 a.m., right? It's, it's a, become one. Well, 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 what happened? Well, we, we recognize with time, it says, oh, once we go past 12, we can sort of reset by a multiple of 12 and start over again. That's what's happening with this modular arithmetic. You can say, look, I can choose a better representation. So instead of choosing 13, we can work with one because they're going to be equivalent. We do it so often, we don't even think about it. But it's really the same type of behavior going on. Now, on another note, sometimes when we think about modular or modular, uh, another way to think about this is think about it as remainders. So in other words, what happens if we divide by n? So if I take a large number and I divide by n, there's going to be some remainder. It might be 0 or 1 or 2, so forth and so on. Two numbers are equivalent if and only if they have the same remainder when you divide by n. So that's another way to think about the grouping. And at this point, you're like, okay, great. What we've talked about is we can say, hey, let's group things together. That's all fine and well, but can we do more? And uh, the good news is, yes. If we act now, 
we too can get an amazing deal. Not only can we group, we can also do arithmetic or put another way, math. So there's more than just a matter of grouping here. We can start talking about the mathematics, how these groups relate to one another, how we can combine and get some information. All right, so let's think about what we can do as far as arithmetic goes. So when I say arithmetic, by the way, I'm talking some basic things like addition and multiplication. So here we've taken the addition and the multiplication tables modulo five. I, I'm picking on five mostly because we can actually fit it on our, our page here, not because there's something really special about five. So what's going on here? Well, when we talk about adding two things, we say, well, let's just add two numbers together. And we say, okay, that's great. So if I add two and two, well, four. Wow, huh. who knew? <laughs> well, we kind of all knew that one. But notice some interesting things, things happen. Two and four become one? What? Isn't two and four six? And the answer is yes to both. There, it is one and six when we talk about things modulo five. So here, we really should emphasize that when we talk about this arithmetic here, this is all done modulo five. And so I can somehow reduce. Whenever I go past five, I say, oh, pull it back, pull it back, and then we can keep going. Now, at this point, you're probably saying, wait a second. How do we know? How do we know it's consistent? Okay, well, first off, what does that question mean? It's a very important question, and I think it's important that we take some time to answer it and also to understand it. One of the important things in mathematics is you want things to be consistent. In other words, as long as your, your inputs are equivalent, your output should be equivalent. So what does that mean? Well, see here, we said, look, if I add two and two, we get four, okay. But remember, we're working modulo five. So I, I, I could have picked two or I could have picked 17 because those are equivalent numbers. And I could have here for this two, I could have picked, you know, 32. How do I know that the result won't change? So that regardless of which numbers I pick, I'm always going to be congruent to the same thing, modulo five. So how do we know that? Well, here's the answer. Suppose I, I want to look at i, and I say it's congruent to i prime. And we'll just do the general case mod n. And I have j is congruent to j prime. And that's again mod n. I want to compare the two, i plus j versus i prime plus j prime. And the question is, would they all be equivalent modulo n? Now, to know if two things are equivalent modulo n is another way of saying, do I know that they differ by a multiple of n? So here's what we can say. When I know two things are equivalent modulo n, I really know that that says, hey, i prime, that's the same as, notice this is an equal sign. not So there's just two lines, not three lines, two. Okay, i prime is i plus some multiple of n. Again, no modular thing. When two things are equivalent to each other, that just means they differ by a proper multiple. We also say, aha, j prime, that's equal to j plus some other multiple of n. I don't know which multiple of n it is, but, but some other multiple of n. So now, if we look at i prime plus j prime, okay, that is, add up the other side, i plus j, and then you have these pieces, a times n plus b times n, so plus a plus b times n. Now, the key thing here is how do the two values differ, i plus j versus i prime plus j prime, and the answer is, they differ by a multiple of n. And by the convention, when two things 
are differing by a multiple of n, it means they're equivalent to each other. So our conclusion is i prime plus j prime is the same as i plus j mod n. So that's how we have consistency. It doesn't matter which representatives we pick. Now, one of the things that this is wonderful to note is it says, pick the easiest representative you can, and then life is good because life becomes much simpler. Now, a similar argument, it's not much harder, shows that multiplication is also consistent. In other words, if I pick an i and a j, it doesn't matter which thing I pick in that modulo n that is equivalent to i, or which thing I pick that's congruent to j, the result is going to be in that same modular group, mod n. Now, we get some really interesting things happening here. So, for instance, uh, of course, 0 times anything being 0, that's not very surprising. Or 1 times anything being in itself, that's not very surprising. But now we get to some weird things. 2 times 3 gives 1? <laughs> this sounds so weird. The first time you hear it, it says, wait, that can't be right. How can I have two numbers multiplying together? Two numbers which are definitely not one, and they're, they're whole numbers, and I end up with one. Well, keep in mind that what we're claiming here is not that the product of two and three is equal to one, but rather that the product of two and three lies in the same equivalence class as one. And so, here's where things get slightly more interesting. Not everything that lies in the equivalence class of one can be written as a number uh, as a number that's equivalent to two times a number equivalent to three. But some can. The goal here is to say, well, which equivalence class do I end up in? Not do I hit all of them? Because you won't. But once you get that idea, it's pretty straightforward to carry out the computations. So we say, okay, three times four, well, mentally we say, okay, that's 12. Well, 12 is too big, it's bigger than five, right? So we say, okay, take off five, take off five again, you're down to two. So three times four is equivalent to two modulo five. And so now we have all these wonderful, interesting things. And modular arithmetic is actually really cool. You can do a lot of things with modular arithmetic. It's used in a lot of computations. In fact, sometimes it's used unknowingly in computations because if you deal with, uh, for example, uh, programming and you say, well, I want to work with certain number types, you might know of something called, you know, there's like overflow, where it says, oh, once you get to a certain point, it rewraps around. And so, okay. Well, that's really, it's doing modular arithmetic, mod this value, maybe 256 or some other large number. So there is some sort of inherent built in to that. But actually, there's other things. You can imagine you want to do a computation with massive numbers, thousands of digits long. How can you handle such a computation? Well, the answer is, don't do it with these really big numbers. Instead, don't do one computation with huge numbers. Do lots of small computations with small numbers using modular arithmetic. Because a lot of the computations that get done really come down to being able to do two things. And computers are great at these two things, multiplication and addition. And they really love addition. It's their favorite thing to do. Like, like computers are just like, ah, oh, give me more addition. I love this stuff. It's my favorite. And so it can carry out a lot of modular arithmetic very quickly. And especially when you deal with modulo smaller numbers, that can be carried out very, very fast. And so you can carry out these computations multiple times, modulo different small numbers. And once you know those, you can put them all back together and you can recover what the original number was supposed to be. It's a beautiful, beautiful technique. All right. So we can do arithmetic, right? We can add. Of course, if we add, we can also subtract. That works perfectly fine. We can multiply. Now we say, well, OK, if you can multiply, can you divide? Hmm, good question. The answer is 
we can kind of divide. Well, kind of. We have to be careful here. So let's start with a really nice basic fact. If I have uh, two numbers, I call them S and N. This is just a really fancy way in math. We say, well, let's just do arbitrary. So if I have two numbers, S and N, and GCD stands for greatest common divisor. In other words, what's the biggest number that can divide into both? Suppose that number is 1. Another way of saying this that you'll sometimes hear is that S and N are relatively prime, which is to say they shared no prime divisors. Then, what turns out to be the case is that the, there is some value T so that S times T is equivalent to 1, modulo N. And in fact, not only is this statement true, it's an if and only if. So if the GCD in S and N is bigger than 1, there's no way that we can get a number so that when we multiply it, we get to 1 mod n. Now, sort of saying that it doesn't hold is not so bad. So for instance, suppose we're doing modulo 6. What's the problem? Well, uh, imagine if I take 2 times 3. What happens? You get 0. OK, and that's really the problem is that when you can have a way to multiply some non-zero things and you get zero out, ah, bad stuff, bad stuff happens. But again, the more interesting thing is, what if the GCD is one? Now, how do we know this is true? Because we say it's a fact. Uh, we won't prove it, but I just want to mention why it's true. Because it's a really interesting story. So uh, it goes back to Euclid. Now, you're probably thinking, ah, here's looking at you, Clid. But probably what you were saying is, wait a second, Euclid was that geometry guy. This doesn't talk about geometry. This is about numbers. So how does geometry fit in? And the answer is, well, it's not really about geometry. Euclid did more, right? So he wrote this collection of books, The Elements, and one of them was about something called the Euclidean algorithm, which was a way to find the greatest common divisor of two numbers. Now, it turns out that if you look at what the algorithm says, that the following is true. It doesn't really matter what you have, but let's suppose for a second that k is equal to the GCD of s and n. It doesn't really, again, s and n are arbitrary, k is just their GCD then it can be shown with a little bit of work that there exists some numbers. Uh, so I'm using shorthand notation. So this backwards E is shorthand for there exist numbers R and T where what's true? Well, R times N plus S times T is equal to K. So you can always find the GCD of two numbers by some appropriate linear combination. And all these are whole numbers. You're not like, oh, I'm going to multiply by fractions. No, no, all these are whole numbers. And now, once you have this, you have one more great leap is to say, OK, start with this formula. And now, if you go take both sides mod n, well, anytime you have a multiple of n, poof, goes away. So we say, aha, there's some place where I can get s times t can grow into k mod n. And now we're done, right? Because we're in a special case where our k is 1. So that's how we know we can do it. By Euclidean algorithm, we can always reduce the greatest common divisor to some appropriate linear combination. And then once we have that, Mod n, life is good. Life is good. Now, we were talking about division. How do we handle division? Well, the way we handle division is we say what? We say that a divided by b is equal to c if a equals b times c. That's the way we think about division. So, what do we want? Well, we want to somehow multiply both sides by b, right? That's the intuition. So 
if I want to multiply by b, it's like I'm multiplying by what we call the multiplicative inverse of b. So that's what's happening here. When I, I'm saying s times t is 1, I'm saying that s and t are sort of the, the inverses of each other. It's how we get to that 1. So what happens? Well, so what we can do is we say what? a divided by s is congruent to a times t. OK, so I can divide by multiplying by the multiplicative inverse. Kind of the idea here is you should really think of it as, ah, I multiply by s t, right? And then you see that the s's cancel, so it's a times t. So we can do some division, as long as our GCD is uh, 1. If the GCD is not 1, like I said, all bets are off. Forget it. Hopeless. Hopeless. And we might, from time to time, pull into this fact. But in general, we just need some very simple ideas. So modular arithmetic says what? Take things and group them, depending upon how they differ, by some multiple of n, because we talk about modulo n, and then carry out arithmetic. Just keep in mind that whenever we differ by some multiple of n in the inputs, it's OK as long as we differ by some multiple of n in the output. And there we go. Not so bad. When in doubt, think of clocks, and that'll help you out. All right, now with some idea of the modular arithmetic, we're ready to think about things in a nice circular fashion. We think about what's happening modulo our period.